evolutionary biologists take a very, very loose definition, genetic change over time, which no one disputes, and say, okay, we have that, so we observe evolution today. And so therefore, there's really no question evolution is a process. When in fact, what Darwin meant was gradual progressive change involving fundamentally changed information. The other day I was on the Stu Peters show, the Stu Peters program, and I'd met Stu um, a couple of months earlier when he had come out here to Idaho where I live and had participated in a political rally in support of then uh, governor candidate Janice McGeehan. And I had attended a dinner with Stu and his, um, I think I've got her title right, uh, maybe senior executive producer or executive producer for the Stu Peters show is out here with him. And at dinner, Stu uh, asked me a question that took me a little bit off guard, took me by surprise. Uh, he asked if I believed in a flat earth. And I was, I mean, perhaps he wouldn't have considered me rude. I, I considered my response to be somewhat rude. I, I laughed at him and told him, of course I didn't. And it had explained that um, having been a fighter pilot in the Air Force and done space-based missile warning operations for the Space Force, I knew better. Uh, and even if I hadn't done those things, I knew better. Um, but he then proceeded to challenge my view and uh, mentioned that he had friends, uh, both close and that he had met otherwise, who had come to believe in a flat Earth. And um, so I listened laughed a little bit more and then listened. And I actually have met several people since then that believe in that view or who'd recently come to believe in that view. Uh, while that doesn't have any bearing necessarily on what I'd like to talk about today, uh, the reason I bring it up is because in the course of conversation, one of the things I'd come to recognize uh, was that many of those who are somehow coming to believe uh, that everything we've been taught about around Earth is a lie and that they need to adopt a different model for understanding uh, the universe in which they live and the world on which they walk, th they were pointing to the Bible as a justification for the need to change their paradigm. And I had explained to Stu then and later subsequently when I joined the show, as I mentioned, when he asked yet again on the show if I believed in a flat earth, and we talked about it for 10 or 15 minutes, um, I explained both then in person and when I was on Stu's show that uh, I happen to not think that one need to accept the idea that the earth is flat in order to believe the story that's told in Genesis. I also mentioned that I happen to believe that some of what you read in the Bible or in Scripture is literal and some is allegorical or, or a parable of sorts and that it's up to a reader to determine uh which is which uh and his question um back as a kind of retort was so are you saying the bible is lying and um i couldn't help but laugh again uh I said i'm not saying that at all i just said i think you have to use your brain to think and use your brain and um a proper spirit to discern and interpret what's going on in scripture. Now, the reason I share that is because I was reflecting on uh, that recent interview with Stu Peters. As I prepared for this interview with today's guest, uh, we're not talking about flat earth, uh, although some of what we will talk about, the Christian listener is necessarily going to reflect upon their own views uh, that they think they have from their um, perusal of the Bible either in Genesis or elsewhere. And the topic we're going to be addressing today is evolutionary biology or Darwinian evolution. And it's a topic that um, I have interest in just because over the course of the past 20 years, as I pursued a religious life or a spiritual life, necessarily you confront this. Um, the unfortunate thing is I think that many religionists, I'll put it that way, uh, predominantly of the Judeo-Christian worldview, will outright dismiss evolutionary biology or the theory of evolution uh, 
and the sciences writ large, if it happens to come into conflict with something they think they understand about God, about creation. Uh, and that's kind of where the story ends for them. And they miss out on a lot of beauty of science in the process. And I speak from personal experience. I, I was unwilling to even entertain certain ideas for a little while after I had become a kind of convert to Christianity. And my own background was Mormonism for most of my adult life, um, which is Christian. Now, having said all of that, um, there is what I'll call perhaps an essential tension or an apparent contradiction between some of what we think we understand about the sciences and what we think we understand in religion. Whether or not that contradiction or tension is necessary is a different question altogether, and it perhaps depends on the uh, topic uh, under consideration. Uh, but I think it's important that we ask questions. There's a need for contradiction. And perhaps, in my view, we need questions and better questions, perhaps even more, in fact, than people think they need some of their current answers, depending on what answers you think you have. Now, I have a friend here in Idaho who uh, I visited with a uh, month, month and a half ago. And on his desk, he had this book. It's called Evolution Mask of Science by John Andelin, who is my guest today. John, welcome to the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. Yeah, happy to have you. And I've, I've read most of your book. I really like what I've read. Uh, and I know that was a bit of a lengthy introduction, but I'm going to take just one more moment to, to kind of share some context. And then I'll, I'll start asking you questions and hope that, John, you'll get to do most of the talking uh, today. Um, but I, I do want to share additional context for this conversation and for the listener or viewer. Um, as I mentioned, I've spent uh, a good deal of time studying a number of things, but including the subject of evolution. Um, and I'm not so willing to dismiss outright ideas that come to me anymore. And I'm, if I feel like they're important, interested in looking into them. And one of my first serious investigations of Darwin and of evolution was in reading, I was going to show the cover here, but it doesn't really have a cover because um, I don't have a dust jacket. It's by Michael Behe. Uh, the name of the book is Darwin's Black Box. And it was my first introduction to a challenge to evolutionary theory. And he, my recollection, it's been over a decade since I've uh, read the book, but um, talks about um, the uh, molecular or cellular challenges to uh, Darwin's theory that weren't necessarily um, immediately apparent in the mid-19th century when Darwin, Darwin wrote on the origin of species and later the descent of man. And um, But he also talks about a concept that perhaps later in the show we'll get into, irreducible complexity. And uh, I really enjoyed that book. And so it kind of opened the window for me to investigate the topic. I later read uh, two books from Stephen Meyer, um, who's also a proponent of intelligent design and an antagonist to uh, the what I might consider an orthodox um, uh, evolutionary biological worldview. But The Signature in the Cell is another book uh, that I'd seen, as well as another one of his books called Darwin's Doubt. And uh, I'll be honest, I found the books a little bit boring, and so didn't really get into them. But there's just a, a lot of material in there. And I've also read uh, a good deal of uh, Darwin's Descent of Man, but not his origin on species. And then just for interest's sake, uh, Human Devolution, a Vedic alternative to Darwin's theory, which was written uh, years ago by Michael Cremo. I very much enjoyed the book. Uh, it was fascinating, eye-opening, and... Um, and uh, some of the Vedic tradition happens to align with conclusions that I have come to in my own personal personal journey and investigation of these issues, which I now lay aside. So all of that said, I have enjoyed John Andelin's book, uh, Evolution, Mask of Science, and I'd recommend it. And we'll talk about it today. So John, uh, to begin with, I think perhaps it's important so that we can start on a common baseline. Help the viewer and listener understand what is Darwinian evolution, 
or what is the common current orthodox thought of your typical evolutionary biologist? Well, when Darwin proposed the theory of evolution in 1859, he had a hypothesis which supposed that all species were related by common descent through a process known as descent with modification. And he looked at things like selective breeding of plants and animals and extrapolated those to the common descent of all species. And so now, uh, since we understand DNA, we understand a lot more about evolution. And so there's what's called the modern synthesis today, which was formulated in the early to mid 19th or 20th century. And so that synthesis is somewhat different than what Darwin proposed. And typically, if you look up evolution on the web, like on Wikipedia or something, it'll say evolution is defined as genetic change over time or change in allele frequencies over time, change in genetic variance over time. Okay, now this is an all-inclusive all idea which really muddies the water because that isn't really what Darwin was proposing because he understood selective breeding. That was understood centuries before Darwin was born. And so what happens is evolutionary biologists take a very, very loose definition, genetic change over time, which no one disputes, and say, okay, we have that, so we observe evolution today. And so therefore, there's really no question, evolution is a process. When in fact, what Darwin meant was gradual progressive change involving fundamentally changed information. Even though he didn't understand DNA, that's the way it should be designed. So what I'm saying is I don't really agree with the modern definitions that are commonly advanced in biology textbooks, on the internet, in speeches, They'll say, it's just genetic change over time, but that's not what it is. It's, if you take, for example, a, uh, a dinosaur with scales and propose that he changed into a bird with feathers that could fly over millions of years, that would require the addition of millions of units of increased genetic information. Now, that sort of phenomenon is not observed, never been observed. So can I can I revisit some of what you've said already up to this point? I want to make sure that I understand what it is that you've laid out. So it sounds to me like what you're saying is that the theory of evolution that Darwin has in his mind uh, at the time he writes on the origin of species and later the descent of man is different than what current uh, evolutionary biologists are saying. Is that true? Exactly. Because they commonly define it, the mechanism, as random variation plus natural selection plus a great deal of time. Darwin noticed that the offspring of all species has variations. If you take pigeons or you take dogs, the offspring are slightly different. There's little, there's a, a spectrum of genetic diversity in all species. And so you can take those variations and breed different strains different breeds. And so those already exist in the population. If you take dogs, for example, which has been, they have been selectively bred for thousands of years. Virtually every trait that you see in a dog breed, such as a poodle, a chihuahua, a St. Bernard, those traits have already have always existed in the genome of the dog species. And so Darwin took that to extrapolate to the origin of all species, that these variations exist. When, when you think about fixed traits like the origin of feathers from reptilian skin, there are no variations in reptiles that could lead to the origin of a feather. It would require fundamental change. It would require mutation. And so what I'm saying is this whole idea of random variations, to extend that to all the grand claims of evolution is a false extrapolation. The Changes required to create a feather from reptilian skin don't exist in the offspring of any reptile. And you can take that to any proposed macroevolutionary change. Now, what I mean by natural selection, I think most people understand that to mean the uh, survival of the fittest, the most uh, adapted to the environment will, on average, survive over those who are less adapted. And so that's the proposed mechanism. Okay. With plus time. Plus millions of years, that's right. 
So will anything that you've set up until now trigger a uh, a um, criticism from an evolutionary biologist uh, in your description of their worldview? Or would you think that they would consider that a fair a fair articulation of their paradigm? I think I've fairly described it, but I'm sure that they will adamantly disagree because they have no examples of true evolution that they can cite as evidence. And so what they cite is things like antibiotic resistance in bacteria, which is not evolution because it doesn't involve fundamentally changed or added genetic information. And so they'll take these minor changes, mutations, which we know are within the reach of probability. And by the way, which occur in an asexually reproducing species. And that in and of itself can't be applied to higher organisms. Okay, but they'll take observations and selective breeding and they'll apply that to things which have never been observed, like the proposed evolution of an ape to a man or of a reptile to a flying bird, things like that. And so they will disagree because that's the only evidence or that's the only observable, quote, evolution that they can point to is things like antimicrobial resistance in bacteria. So did Darwin recognize in his own day the weakness, any of the weaknesses in his proposed theory? One of the weaknesses that he recognized was the fossil record. He recognized that it did not support the predictions of gradualism that you would logically come up with. Uh, and and in assuming that evolutionary theory was true, because there would be millions and millions of intermediate forms. And he acknowledged this plainly in his book. And he stated that he thought future uh, research into paleontology would uh, show these transitional species. Has the fossil record improved to the point where now Darwin's fears have been uh, laid to rest, or do we still have the problem that Darwin identified? We have the exact same problem, although evolutionary biologists will sharply disagree. They will say that there are thousands of transitional species. And the problem is the fossil record is extremely subjective. It's interpreted by a few people who have expertise in comparative anatomy, and it's accepted globally by the entire evolutionary community, which don't have expertise in paleontology. They just accept it. The other, another uh, obstacle that Darwin saw is the continuity of life. Basically, all of life today is what we call typological, meaning that uh, species are organized into different groups, birds, mammals, fish, reptiles, plants, and so forth. And he, he thought that with, logically you would think that evolution would be, uh, or that life today, if evolution was a true process, would be confu a confusion, that there would be gradations between birds and mammals, for example, which they don't exist. And so he acknowledged that as a problem. So I think those, and, and another thing he acknowledged was things like beauty and how uh, aesthetic design in nature is not really explicable by Darwinian mechanisms, or at least it's very difficult to explain the extreme ornamentation of some animals, such as the peacock. That reminds me, um, to put it a different way or to use a different vocabulary of King Jamesian uh, language in the Bible that talks about a creation process, and it mentions the word kind. You know, each of these did multiply after its own kind, whether you're talking fishes or the whales of the sea and uh, and so forth, or humans two by two. So what, what I've heard you say, and I want to try and restate it, correct me if I'm wrong, because I, I need to get this right. You, you mentioned random variation and natural selection plus time as kind of the essential equation of evolutionary biology. Is that accurate? Yes. Okay. I'm going to read to you um, from the introduction of your book, a few statements that you make, which I like, but I think they require support, which is what you try to do in, throughout your book. And so let me read um, several statements here, and I'd like to have you address these, uh, which is essentially now getting into the main chapters and topics that you choose to address in your book to support your uh, your introductory view here. You say that the entire framework of Darwinism is founded on metaphysical presuppositions. You, I'm skipping ahead, 
say that the theory of evolution is an elaborate collection of proposals founded on man's speculation as to what happened over millions of years. I'm skipping ahead again. The framework that Darwin constructed to support the precepts of evolution was founded on many assumptions which have since been invalidated. And so when I read things like that, I think, okay, like what? Which you address in the book. And then last, and I really like this last point that you make. I think it's excellent. A fundamental doctrine of Darwinism is that all life is the result of natural processes and that no intelligent design exists in that process. This doctrine is assumed, I'll read that again, this doctrine is assumed in the name of science despite the fact that intelligence is the only proven force in the universe capable of creating complexity. The theory of evolution as it is propagated today is a religious philosophy that wears the mask of science, hence the, the subtitle of your book. So if that's a subtitle, maybe that's just the title, Evolution Mask of Science. But help me understand then what you mean by metaphysical presuppositions or philosophical assumptions or religious assumptions. What are those assumptions that are the foundation then um, of, of, of the theory of evolution uh, and have we already covered them? Uh, have you already addressed those? Or is that, are you talking about something altogether different? If you look at the primary evidences presented for evolution, what are the most persuasive arguments given to support evolution? You can categorize them into several groups. Uh, some of the most widely used are homology, which refers to the similarity of species, imperfections of nature, the continuity of life, vestigial structures, embryology. These are some of the most common evidences. Probably 90% of the evidences used to support evolution are fall in these categories. And what I'm claiming is that these aren't scientific evidence. They're based on what they perceive to be inconsistencies with intelligent design. If you read Origin of Species, Darwin throughout the book compared his theory to a model of creative design. And so he had to make assumptions regarding the nature of the creator. And this is what happens today. Now, if you go to a biology class in a university and they present things like molecular atavisms, pseudogenes, ERVs, uh, transposons, and, or they'll, they'll look at comparative biochemical systems like the hemoglobin of different species or cytochrome C, that all sounds scientific. But when you actually challenge it, it's based on a perceived disproving of God. And what they'll say is this is more consistent with a model of, of evolution than it is with a model of intelligent design. And then they make suppositions about the nature of a creator. For example, in using embryology, uh, if you look at some of the founders of the modern synthesis, like um, Theodosius Dobzhansky was one of the founders of the modern evolutionary synthesis in the 1940s, he said uh, later on when he wrote a seminal paper outlining the evidence of evolution, he mentioned things like embryology saying, well, why would uh, a creative intelligence put gill slits in human embryos if they didn't breathe like, like our ancestors of fish? He said, was he basically uh, making practical jokes or why mm -hmm. would he make such a multitude of types? What sort of foreordained plan would be in involved? And so basically, in all of these evidences that are presented, they're basically trying to disprove God. They're not proving evolution directly hmm. in the field of molecular biology, which sounds most evolutionists look at molecular biology as the sort of smoking gun evidence for evolution. But when you actually start challenging it, when you actually look at it, they can't take the DNA of an ape and show through mutations how that could evolve into the DNA of a human. They don't have any idea. All they can do is look at things that they think are imperfect. Mm -hmm. And so what this actually is, is a mockery of creative design. And so right. this is what I say. If you go to a biology class, it sounds like they're using science. But if you challenge it, it always ends up into a debate over the nature of an intelligent creator. Mm, that's interesting. You, you mentioned etymology, I'm sorry, embryology, and gave an example. Talk uh, again about homology. What is what is meant by homology, and can you give us an example of how that's used um, as, as supportive evidence? Homology refers to similarity of structure or biochemical systems 
in all forms of life. For example, um, if you look on very simple, uh, on a very simple example, the grasping hand of a human and a chimpanzee are very similar in design. They have an opposable thumb. The anatomy, okay. the bone structure, and, and if you look at biochemical systems, it's the same thing. And so they show, if you look at the DNA of a chimpanzee and a human, which is supposedly our closest ancestor, there's a lot of parallels. And so that refers to what they're saying is not that they can show that a chimpanzee's DNA could be gradually modified to the DNA of a human. They're just saying, why would an intelligent designer create things that are similar when they serve mm -hmm. different purposes? Or a real striking example would be, if you look at the uh, flipper of a dolphin, it has all the bones of a grasping hand of a human. And so they think it is just absurd to think that a, a designer would use that prototype to create something that was adapted for swimming. And so they suppose that the purposes or the um, logic, what they think would be a logical way to create a dolphin, if you wanted to make a marine mammal, you wouldn't use the grasping bones of a hand. And so this is, this is the most widely used evidence. It's really not scientific because it requires you to make suppositions about God. Right. So you can't yeah. really directly show. In fact, if you, if you want to look at this from a scientific standpoint, the, the DNA that creates a dolphin's flipper to human hand, are not, these are not similar genes. And so they don't even extend to the, to the genetic code. So the molecular basis for this doesn't even fit, at least in many instances. Sometimes it does, but in most cases, it doesn't fit. Mm -hmm. So again, it's just a philosophical, what they believe is they believe they're disproving God, and that you should mm -hmm. just accept evolution by default. So you're not dismissing random variation that is a true principle or a true process that's observable right exactly yeah that's how we create different breeds of fruits and vegetables and different breeds of cattle and domestic animals is through random variation everyone knows this everyone understands it so help me understand if the distinction between micro evolutionary processes perhaps what is meant by that maybe you can correct me is the idea of random variation and natural selection. Um, help me understand if it's, a, it's useful to make the distinction between microevolutionary processes that are observable and macroevolution, the idea that, because that's, that's one of the ways in which I have come to um, characterize or categorize uh, this science is I think, okay, there's a lot to uh, microevolutionary processes I don't believe in macro evolutionary process. Uh, I think it's a leap of faith and essentially a religious worldview that I don't per personally believe in. Is that a fair way of characterizing it or is it not? And, and why not? You're thinking very logically and a lot of people that extend micro evolution to macro evolution are not even thinking scientifically because it's common knowledge in a scientific discipline that you can't just extend observations by simple linear extrapolation to greater claims which are untested mm. and the extrapolation of micro evolution which like you said random variations what such as you see in dog breeds to extend that to supposing that a whale could evolve from a land mammal is a fantastic extrapolation which is unfounded it's unjustified and the reason you know i draw a fairly distinct line between macro evolution and micro evolution on mathematical grounds okay and maybe we can get into that a little later in the discussion but it's not the same process because it's mathematically impossible to extend small observations to larger observations given millions of years and to be a little more specific if you take for example antibiotic resistance in bacteria they're rapidly reproducing they produce in huge numbers and a very short generation time and most of the mutations that result in antibiotic resistance involve single nucleotide substitutions or single units of genetic information, okay. which can realistically occur by chance. Now, by nucleotides, for your viewers that might not know this, that would be comparable to digital code in a computer program where you have like ones and zeros defining all computer programs. Well, in DNA, you have four different possible substitutions for each position. And so 
it's even more complex than a computer code. But the point is that to randomly change units of information, uh, you can do you can change a few by luck, but you can't change many by the same process because it it the the it, you start getting into exponentially increasing in probability. And, and an example you can look at is it's it's possible to flip a coin ten times in a row and get ten heads. It's not very likely. There's about one chance in a thousand. But you can't just flip a coin a hundred times in a row and get a hundred heads by the same process because that would require not millions of years, but trillions and trillions and trillions of years, because it's just, it's too improbable. So you, although you could argue that it's the same process, it's not the same because it would require massive changing of units of information, which cannot realistically occur by chance. Well, along, along those lines then, Help me understand what Michael Behe meant by irreducible complexity. I mean, it's not just that if you have enough time and enough mutation, things eventually end up uh, going from point A to point B to point Z, but that there are certain leaps perhaps that are required in that evolutionary mechanism that are just simply not either not plausible or not possible. Yeah, Michael Behe, uh, and, and by the way, this is one of the... Uh, challenges which Darwin saw to evolutionary theory, the evolution of complexity by gradualism. And Michael Behe noted that in biochemical systems, for example, that there are many examples of systems where they would not function without all integrated parts together. And so his proposal of irre irreducible complexity, he compared it to a spring-powered mousetrap, where in very simple terms, a mousetrap couldn't gradually be created by gradually modifying parts, you have to have these specific elements of that mousetrap or it's not going to work. There's many examples of this in biology. Evolutionary biologists think they've refuted it uh, by proposing extremely unrealistic um, pathways of evolution, which would require the appearance of extremely improbable mutations. And so I don't really, uh, you know, I agree that there's many irreducibly complex systems in biology, but I take it a step further that even if they aren't re irreducibly complex, you can't mathematically justify the appearance of mutations that result in functionally integrated systems. Functionally integrated systems. You know, you can't, for example, the reason a monkey can never type a meaningful work is because the words that he would type would have functionally integrated meaning. Mm -hmm. it, it would contain information. A, a monkey might be able to type a three-letter word if you gave him millions of years, but you can't extend that to saying he could type a novel because the number of possible combinations is so vast. And in the mm -hmm. same token, if you look at systems which have been presented as irreducibly complex, for example, the bacterial flagellum, the uh, coagulation cascade, or the mantis shrimp is an example that I use in my book. Or I think the best one is single cell life. You take the simplest form of life that's known, a bacterium, and you try to reduce it to individual components, RNA, DNA, the ribosome, cell membrane. These things cannot be, these things each in and of themselves would require immensely improbable events to be created without any sort of designing intelligence. The idea that they could all come together before they could function as a unit is far beyond the reach of chance. And so, although if, if you look on the internet, irreducible complexity, they'll say it's a failed argument. They've never even addressed the problem of single cell life and how that's irreducibly complex. They don't even have a proposed candidate. Not only can they not propose how it could evolve by chance, they don't even know what, what the characteristics would be like. They, they, a, a single re self-replicating cell that is simpler than the simplest one that we have today. So it's, it's not even necessarily a factor of how much time you've been given. Even if you've got millions or billions of years, some of these processes uh, that are required to create something that is functionally integrated or as the term that Michael Behe uses, um, irreducibly complex, 
It's it's not even because the critic will say, well, all I need is billions of years or trillions of years or an infinite amount of time. If if I and and statistically, I'm going to end up having emerge in this universe or one of many universes the possibility of of these leaps that are required. Which I mean, it's essentially a religious argument at that point. But what it sounds like you're saying to me is that even with the required time, whatever that might statistically look like, which would be immensely an immense amount of time, you, it sounds like you're you're saying also that it's just simply not possible without some intelligent imposition upon uh, upon the process. That's your view. It's not even close. And what happens is biologists they take millions of years and they round it off to infinity. But what they should mm -hmm. be doing is taking the number of combinatorial possibilities of mutations and round that off to infinity because for all practical purposes, it is infinite. If mm -hmm. you take just 100 units of DNA, for example, okay. uh, human DNA it is composed of 6.3 billion units of information. If you just take 100 of those and you try to change those to a specified result, there are 10 to the 60th combinatorial possibilities of just 100 units of DNA. So the hyperspace, it's massive. You might as well just say infinity because it's so huge. And, and, and so with that, then there's never gonna be a specified uh, outcome for mutations because the number of possibilities is uh, so huge. You could, you could uh, make an example. Um, how do you create a new computer program? Do you intelligently create one or do you just randomly introduce mistakes and hope or, or test the result and see if it works better? Even if you had a computer that could test millions and millions of mistakes per second, it would not work because the number of possible changes is so enormous. I mean, it's just not, it's, it's beyond, when you're dealing with limited population sizes, limited numbers of generations, there's no way that random mutations, a random process could possibly create the integrated complexity that exists in nature. Let me ask you, this This is more, perhaps it's, well, it's your worldview. I mean, perhaps it's more religious in nature, but I mentioned Michael Cremo's book, Human Devolution, which is a Vedic alternative to uh, Darwin's theory. Do you personally believe that he, modern humans have been on the earth for more than what we see in recorded history, more than the last 6,000 years? Or do you think that modern humans have only been around as long as a literal reading of the Bible would indicate? Well, I personally believe that they've not been on the earth for longer than 6,000 years. As far as science, I would say there's no evidence that they have. This is something which is supposed through assumptions made through the fossil record, assumptions that the molecular clock hypothesis is valid, which is based on the fossil record. And so I, I don't see any reason why people are persuaded to believe that humans have been on the earth for that long. I, I don't think there's any scientific validity to it. And that gets into carbon 14 dating. It gets into exactly. age of earth arguments. It gets into, um, well, perhaps we won't go down this alley, but you do address it in your book. And I think you do a good job. And I like what you've said in your book about age of matter age of earth uh discussion and so let's let's table that for now but if someone's interested in getting into the age of rocks for example i think you do a really nice job in your book uh, but i, I want to ask you a different question i'll, I'll let you uh, say what you'd like to say and then i'd like to ask you a question about back to darwin's thought i just wanted to mention that anytime you look at, at the uh, science quote unquote of evolution Bear in mind that there is no accountability for these people who make these statements. They say that man has been living for hundreds of thousands of years prior to Adam and Eve. What sort of accountability or relevance does that have to day-to-day -to -day life? Now, in my previous uh, profession, I just retired about a year ago from uh, pathology, which is a branch of laboratory medicine. I have daily accountability in what I say, all the reports I sign, I have to take uh, competency exams, there's no tenure, uh, and the diagnoses that I made have relevance to patients. If I overcall something, if I undercall something, I can get sued, I can get, I can lose credibility with my peers. And so what I'm saying is the hard sciences today 
physics, chemistry, uh, modern medicine, and engineering, these all have accountability. And I want to emphasize that if you're going to think about what level of confidence you should give in things like dating the earth, understand that there is no accountability whatsoever. These are mostly academicians, tenured professors who are making statements which they cannot prove and which are very difficult to disprove. And so that's really important, especially when you consider that evolution is the foundation of a worldview. It's not just science or it's not just trying to explain biology. It's trying to explain humans, why we're here, what our purpose is, and so forth. I read a fun book recently called A Short History of Nearly Everything by Bill Bryson. Bill Bryson's, he's a He's a funny read. Uh, perhaps, um, I think maybe that's even the better known book. There was another one called Walk in the Woods. Uh, quite vulgar, hilarious. Uh, and it's about his journey up the Appalachian Trail. And in his A Short History of Nearly Everything, I remember he traces through in one of his chapters um, kind of a, a recent modern history in the sciences of the dating of the earth. And it's eye-opening to see just how all over the map uh, those who have attempted to date rocks, for example, or the Earth or the universe um, have been. I mean, we've gone from um, thousands of years to those who are literal creationist, catastrophist scientists, and of that bent to then turning into hundreds of thousands, then millions, and then back to hundreds of thousands, then to billions, and the number's been changing constantly for uh, the better part of the last couple of centuries. And, and so it's worth pointing that out, at least, to say that even the you know, supposedly solid sciences, that we think we've got some things figured out. Now, you give it a couple decades, we'll realize just how much we don't have figured out. And I'll say, say this, too. Um, I think perhaps I have a different view than you do, John, on not on the evolutionary biology piece, which I, I think we're very aligned, but I'll just point out on age of Earth and the um, longevity of potential, the potential longevity of the modern human species, I have a different view, but that also gets into a, it's a kind of, I mean, it's a worldview and it's, um, and, and it requires paying attention, us choosing which evidence we'll pay attention to whether or not we consider it valid evidence, what we choose to believe in. And everyone, I suppose, has the prerogative to make those decisions. And I respect the fact that uh, others have different views. Um, I happen to believe that the Earth is quite old. I'm not saying the scientists have got, um, got that dialed in. And I also happen to like your reasons that you give in your book for why it's possible that that they could come to the conclusions they have about a very old earth, for example, and about the creative mechanism. There's this underlying assumption, again, in the sciences, uh, the religious worldview must be wrong because they insist on a six-day creation process, the scientist will say, but we happen to know the earth is very old. And they're making, again, assumptions about the creative process, assumptions about a, an intelligent designer, and assumptions about uh, what you could call create creation ex nihilo, out of nothing. Uh, rather than reorganization of matter or the recycling of matter from that's that's been around a very long time in an ancient cosmos and so i think you address that very well and while it's not the primary um purpose of your work um it was necessary for you to go into that and i do like your view on that and i i find that that's something that's been useful for me to weave into the fabric of my own worldview so I thought I'd point that out. Yeah, I, I kind of feel like the age of the earth in a way is not that important in the overall discussion, because if somebody wants to believe that the earth is billions of years old, that doesn't prove evolution. And so right. it's, it's somewhat I mean, it's absolutely necessary for evolution to be a viable hypothesis. But just to say that the earth is billions of years old, you can say it's trillions of years old. There's still not enough time to create the diversity of species that exist. and so. I think of it as not that critical of an issue. And if you want to look at the actual uh, evidence, people act like this is rock solid science, but there's a lot of serious problems with the dating of the earth that have come up just yeah. in the last 20 yeah. years. Uh, for, for example, the 
the finding of incompletely fossilized soft tissue and dinosaur bones in multiple species, which they cannot explain by a hundreds of millions of year old uh, fossil. And, and this has been documented, uh, and, and some of them have been uh, tested by, uh, for radioactive carbon-14 and have been validated a millions of year old fossil. So I think this is a huge problem. Uh, and, and many other problems, many other inconsistencies with the fossil record. But like you say, I didn't really emphasize it a lot in my book because I think the really uh, critical issues, the way you prove evolution or the way you disprove evolution is through mathematics and through actual biology. Look, here's what we see experimentally. Here's what you're claiming. We don't have any evidence of this experimentally. And you can't show me through math that it's even possible. So what, so what is the substance of the theory? I'm going to change gears here. Help us understand the impact of Darwin's evolutionary theory on human thought, generally speaking. I mean, we can get into specifics of society, politics, religion. We've already kind of been um, touching upon. But what impact has this had on the sciences? I mean, yeah, I, I mean, I think people often praise Darwin as a great scientist. They compare him to Newton and Galileo. What he did for biology was comparable to what Newton did for physics. I think this is a ridiculous statement because I, you know, I read Origin of Species and I don't think he, Darwin was a genius. I think he looked at things that other people have thought of over centuries. And what he said was in line with the evolving worldview at the time. That is secularism, atheism, um, the, these ideas that we have today were germinating at the time of Charles Darwin. And so the reason it was so widely accepted was because it fit with the ideology of the age. And today, if you look at uh, evolution, it's the foundation of atheism. It's the foundation of every worldview that springs from atheism, things like eugenics, abortion, biologic determinism, racism, uh, no human free will wokeism, all this stuff, if you actually examine their fundamental precepts, they're founded on the presumption of evolution. And it leads to this kind of thought. It leads to people rejecting God. And in fact, the very basis of Darwinian thought, as I, as we kind of touched on earlier, is a philosophical rejection of intelligent design. What they do is they start out and we're going to say, okay, we're going to look at all of biology and we're going to absolutely exclude any consideration of a designing intelligence. So I would pose the question, how do you claim to be practicing science when you exclude the only competing hypothesis from consideration? Especially in historical science like evolution, where you're looking at data and you're comparing hypotheses. You're not actually setting up an experiment to show evolution. Because they've tried that, and all the experiments to produce evolution have failed. And so what they're trying to do is they're trying to look back, and they compare intelligent design with a model of evolution. And again, like I said, you can't do that because you can't make, you can't construct a model of intelligent design with ma without making philosophical assumptions. But, you know, one of the things that has really motivated, motivated me to get this message out there is because I see the philosophical impact of evolution as extremely damaging. It, it causes people to reject uh, that they even have human free will. In fact, some of the leading evolutionary biologists today, like Richard Dawkins, refer to humans as basically robotic. You know, it might seem shocking to some people to think that people really believe that humans have no free will when it's so self-evident that we do. I mean, nobody actually conducts their life in a manner that they don't think they have free will. But yet, evolutionary biologists have used this idea to justify things like rape, sexual infidelity, uh, no personal accountability. These worldviews are all based on the idea that uh, we are defined by our genetic heritage and by our environment. And so therefore, we don't really have control over our actions. And this whole uh, worldview is used to justify things like socialism, uh, social justice, all of this stuff, because really we don't have any higher ability. We don't have any self-determination. And I think this is a very, very dangerous uh, 
worldview and it, and it necessarily infringes on basic human rights. So I, I don't think you can overstate the impact that it's had on our, our views on, on how people see themselves in the world. And if you look at uh, virtually everyone who is out there on the speaking circuit, promoting evolution and writing books, invariably they're all liberal progressives, Marxists, um, woke, all this is, is basically, they think that science is justifying their worldview ultimately. John, so we we're only able to scratch the surface of a topic like this. Clearly, that's why it requires writing a book. Uh, and many books have been written uh, both for and against uh, evolutionary biology, Darwinian evolution, the theory of evolution. Uh, I, I came across uh, one of David's Psalms as I was preparing for our interview, which I want to read. And then I'd like to give you a, a last word uh, to talk, to, to inform the viewer and the listener where it is that they can go buy your book, observe your work on YouTube and so forth. So let me read this. When I consider your heavens, David says, the work of your fingers, the moon and the stars, which you have ordained, what is man that you are mindful of him and the son of man that you visit him for you have made him a little lower than the angels and have crowned him with glory and honor. I believe that. Uh, I'm grateful for the work of people like John Andelin, uh, who help us tease out some of these issues that aren't necessarily natural for us to tease apart, parse through, because uh, we're always bombarded with a worldview, as you've mentioned, that is masquerading as academic, uh, but typically comes from an atheistic viewpoint. Uh, or a leftist progressive worldview anymore. It's materialistic and not spiritual. And we have we need the pendulum to swing back a bit if we're to get at the truth, which is why work like yours is so helpful. So, John, uh, I'll give you the last word as we wrap up our interview and help people understand where they can go buy your book and uh, see your work. Well, you know, you mentioned that Psalms uh, quotation, and I think that you can look at nature and logically infer intelligent design. In fact, I think it takes an active denial of a designing intelligence to believe that random forces can create the level of complexity that exists. Now, what I've done is I've I've made a book, I've had a second edition, which is available on my website, which is www.maskofscience.com, uh, which you can download free. I've, I'm not even selling it right now. I am planning in the next month of making some printed versions available for people who want a hard copy. Right now, there aren't any hard copies that are available. Uh, I'm motivated primarily to just get this message out. I've also created some YouTube videos uh, under Mask of Science. We can put a link in to your Mask of Science channel so that people can just click on that and it'll go right to your work and see some of those videos. So I, I, I think they're well done. They're short, uh, unlike my podcast. Uh, you can spend 10 or 15 minutes actually uh, addressing very specific topics like um, the problem of beauty. I don't know if that's how you've titled it, the, the, the development of uh, higher intelligence, mathematical probabilities, and so on, some of the things that we talked about today on the show. Okay, thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to be on here. Yeah, hey, thanks for joining me, John. Keep up the good work. I think uh, messages like yours are incredibly important. Thank you.